Hello, Caleb. Hey, Mike. How's it going? It's going pretty well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, what are you drinking tonight? Tonight, I have an East Village Athletic Club cocktail. What is in the, that? It is from the PDT uh, uh -huh. recipe book. It's a tequila-based cocktail with uh, some chartreuse and some marnier and some lemon juice. And uh, it came out particularly delicious tonight. How about you? What are you drinking? Uh, coincidentally, I'm also drinking a tequila drink. It's called the El Puente from the same book. Uh, it's tequila and grapefruit juice and uh, St. Germain and vermouth. Oh, nice. nice. We both went uh, all out with the effort and, and procured fresh fruit tonight. Yes. Excellent. I had a grapefruit left over and it was going to go bad, so it became a drink. Nice. I think fresh fruit is the traditional third episode anniversary so yes you know, for episode like three it's totally appropriate so uh how are you feeling about your your reservation i'm feeling great i actually went to the uh, local tesla store today uh to just sort of hang out and they actually had a model x in the uh in stock finally so oh they did in yeah. uh, in stanford yeah at the stanford store i got to sit in it and look at it and there were dozens of people gawking at it so it was, it was kind of fun and just reignited my excitement for you know, wanting to have a Model 3 in there or in my driveway. So really excited still. Did you get to make the, the doors go up and down? I did not. They were being very uh, cautious because there were so many people nearby. They were afraid people were going to hit it. But it was crazy because people <laughs> were like hanging on the door, trying to get it to pull down. And they're like, excuse me, please don't touch the doors. And um, it, it was definitely a lot of people very excited to sit in it and, you know, test out the back seats. But it was uh it was really great in person. The seats were very comfortable. I got to sit in it. Uh, the windshield is super impressive from the inside. So, um, yeah, it looks, looks really good. And, uh, you know, the fact they have, uh, some to deliver to the stores and they had one for test driving, uh, is a good sign. So that, that's interesting that you mentioned that people are hanging on the doors. I kind of assumed that you would be able to like close the door, but it sounds like what you're saying is you have to actually let the doors close automatically. Yeah, I think you have to actually click the button um, inside or on the door. And one of the um, people in the store was not very happy with people sort of manually trying to close the door. And <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I would bet you could actually do that, but um, they were they were not pleased with that. And, you know, I got to try the, the front door, which closes on its own. So you'd get in and then you tap on the brake and the door slams behind you. So it was kind of fun. So uh, so how are you feeling about your, your reservation? What We're now three or four weeks in. Do we have a... a, a count for how many people are have also reserved model threes as of right now uh the unofficial number is uh just under four hundred thousand, uh confirmed by both a, a vp level uh, executive at tesla and also elon musk mentioned the four hundred thousand number so approaching four hundred thousand reservations wow that's a lot um how how many cars have they shipped so far again in total they've shipped around eighty thousand vehicles um in their lifetime and they five X that with reservations just for the model three. Yeah. So that's what I sort of wanted to chat with you about tonight was the expectations around production. Um, now that we have more firm numbers, there was obviously a lot of speculation before the model three was unveiled that Tesla was going to have to figure out how to increase their production, that a lot more people would want the model three than have ever wanted the model S or the roadster before it. And there were articles coming out about there's no way Tesla will ever be able to produce that many vehicles. And Tesla themselves saying that they wanted to produce half a million vehicles by 2020. And only now that the model three has already hit 400,000 reservations that I think is it really time to dissect uh, the reality of that statement and sort of talk through how they've fared in the past because there's both the ability to produce that many cars, um, what it will take to get there, and the likelihood that Tesla will actually be able to meet their deadline of delivery starting at the end of 2017. How many vehicles are like BMW or Mercedes, like what are they putting out for given Tesla's history of, of delivering Model S's and Model X's? So the Model S is actually, uh, because it's been in production since 2012, probably the best uh, example of what they can do for a segment. And so the Model S is the best-selling full-sized uh, luxury sedan. And it has about 26% market share in the U.S. So there's about 100,000 U.S. Uh, large luxury sedans sold a year. And last year, the Model S sold 26,000. And the next uh, largest seller was the Mercedes S-Class at 22,000. And then following that was the 10,000 uh, unit BMW 7 Series. The Model S uh, already is uh, the number one in its class. And so the Model 3 will certainly be uh, one of the top performing across the uh, 
the Audi A4 and the BMW 3 Series. And with that many reservations already in tow, it's pretty obvious that they will will hit those numbers. And so I think the really interesting uh, part of this is all just Tesla hasn't yet shown that they can produce uh, at the volume that would be required to make the Model 3 work. And so it's going to take them uh, imp- increasing production quite drastically in the next few years to get there. Uh, and so there, there's still a lot of work to do, but I think there's a lot uh, in the past that we can look to in Tesla's production ramp from the Roadster to the Model S and the Model X um, that will be instructive in understanding whether or not it's likely that they'll be able to uh, fulfill this uh, pretty immense amount of demand. So they're, they're building all of their these vehicles at their Fremont plant, at the, the NUMI plant in Fremont that they purchased. Um, can we talk a little, let's talk a little bit about uh, the capacity of that plant. Like what, what are they currently churning out there and, and what can they possibly uh, ultimately like churn out of there? Tesla got the, uh, their own factory in 2010 and it was in anticipation of needing to produce the Model S. Because if we remember, the uh, Roadster was actually produced by Lotus. Uh, and so Lotus was in the UK and they were producing, you know, 100 a month, something very, very low, uh, about 800 or so a year. So extremely low, uh, very little automation, uh, very hand built process uh, because, you know, the, the Roadster only sold about 2,500 in its entire lifetime. So a pretty low number. Um, Tesla knew that they couldn't go that model. They, they needed to build their own factory. And so they originally had planned to actually build a factory in uh, New Mexico. And they actually were ready to go with construction, but it was canceled. And then they thought, well, we'll build one in San Jose, but it was way too expensive. And so they fortunately were able to find uh, a partner in Toyota and Toyota was a partner with GM at this Numi plant, which was a collaboration between GM and uh, and Toyota to manufacture vehicles. Just its own fascinating story of <laughs> two companies trying to teach each other how to uh, improve and and it going really sour. Um, yeah, our listeners should be uh, if if you're interested in listening to a, a podcast. There's an excellent This American Life that Caleb uh, pointed out to me, and it's a fascinating listen about the Numi plant and the before and after of when GM and Toyota, because it was actually built by GM, operated by GM for quite some time, and then they partnered with Toyota, and there was a radical transformation of the uh, of the productivity and output of the plant uh, afterwards in the eighties. Yeah, for the positive um, with the Toyota uh, production process, which was um, gave workers a lot more control and autonomy and respect. And uh, and and so it it was definitely a a very large plant coincidentally and and well timed for Tesla uh, in 2008 when things were going pretty terrible for uh, the U.S. economy and the global economy and GM in particular, uh, they were getting ready to sell off the plant and their interest in it. Tesla was just now working with Toyota on some uh, battery pack uh, special projects. And so actually Tesla was able to acquire the plant for a remarkably uh, low amount of money. They they bought it for only $42 million. Uh, <laughs> That's great. Like, and for people who aren't aware, like this is not in some remote location, like remote Kentucky or South Carolina or something. This is in Silicon Valley. Like you drive by this when you're going from San Jose to Oakland, it, it's right off of 880. Yeah, it is smack dab in the middle. I mean, the, uh, apparently like uh, Solyndra, which is the, uh, solar plant that, you know, kind of went belly up was trying to build a plant nearby and it was going to be like uh, $700 million or something, something insane. Um, and, and many of these other plants that are built in the U S for other major car fa- car uh, manufacturers are in, in the multi-billion dollar investments, um, to build them. And so they got a really great deal. I mean, they, they spent, uh, another, uh, $17 million on equipment and spare parts that were acquired from it at a significant discount. Um, <laughs> It's like a business version of an HGTV uh, renovation show here. They made a purchase. They did a renovation budget. And so they were very fortunate to get that because at that point, they didn't even have much cash on hand um, to be able to finance this. So it worked out extremely well for Tesla to be able to acquire this because this is a 370 acre plot and it has a 5.5 million square foot main production facility um, for producing the vehicles. 
So this puts it on par with the BMW uh, Spartanburg plant, which is uh, in uh, uh, South Carolina, and also the Toyota plant in Kentucky, uh, which produces a Camry. Uh, is uh, just a couple million square feet larger at around 7 million square feet. So this is a a full-size plant, and at its peak uh, during the Toyota reign, it was producing 500,000 vehicles a year. Um, So the the actual physical plant capacity um, in its sort of uh, size and and structure and its ability to produce cars should be able to get to up to half a million cars a year. So I think in terms of the physical space and the plant capability, with this one factory, uh, they should be able to produce half a million cars a year. So I think that's a check mark in the plus column for uh, feasibility, that at least with the factory they have, they should be able to produce half a million cars um, in it. That's a mind-blowing number. I mean, that's what, that's like 1,300 cars per day rolling out of that plant. I mean, how do you even like coordinate that much traffic, let alone assemble them that's that's mind-blowing to me yeah i mean it it is uh incredible when you think about how there are dozens of these plants all throughout the country for many different car makers and they all operate at a pretty similar 300 400 500 thousand uh, car a year sort of volume and that that is you know as you said about a thousand to 1300 cars a day that would have been it would have (laughs) In three days at a normal car plant, they could have produced all the roadsters that were ever made in, in three <laughs> years. And that in 50 days, uh, in about two months, they would have been able to produce all the Model S's that have ever been produced since 2012. So when Tesla gets to this scale, I get, when and if, I, I think when, it, it's going to be an incredible amount of vehicles um, coming off the line. And I think that one of the things that has to be remembered is that it takes time to get to that level of production, both from a demand side uh, and expertise in actually being able to produce that many. As you said, it is a, a pretty remarkable feat um, and that there's so many different components that have to come together uh, to actually be able to pull that off reliably that you need time to actually ramp up. Um, and so there's both like production ramp on particular vehicles to go from the alpha builds to the beta builds to the engineering uh, concept vehicles to the first production vehicles to mass production. But then at the macro level for the, for the factory, the crazy thing too, is that they actually have to do this while they're also producing model S's and model X's. (laughs) They have to expand their production in the uh, tech world, sort of the concept of uh, assembling the airplane on the way down uh, for a startup (laughs) is sort of this famous sort of phrase. And uh, they have to assemble the factory while they keep producing new vehicles and at a pretty healthy clip. So how much of the capacity of that factory are they using right now? Do we know? Uh, They're using about 10% of the uh, capacity since they're producing about 50,000 vehicles last year. And this year they're on on target to do 80 to 90,000. So not double uh, this year uh, over last, but um, just about 60 to 70% more this year and this year they've already put in uh in in place improvements that will allow them to do that some of the interesting things are uh, the number of robots so (laughs) tesla uses uh is one of the most advanced manufacturing plants for cars and they use the most robots out of any other car maker that i could find and for the initial model s line they had about 160 specialized robots and 10 of them are the largest in the world um, and funny enough, they're all named after X-Men characters. So it's just sort of a <laughs> interesting geeky uh, tidbit. Um, well, in, it is in Silicon Valley. So, yeah, it is. And it's, it's run by a lot of geeks. Um, in October of 2015, they upgraded the, the plant um, with over $100 million. And now they have 542 robots. So they went from 160 to 542. And they also now have two, uh, two production lines. So before they had one production line for Model S, and now they have two, which will be able to produce both Model S and Model X, um, and eventually start being able to slot in Model 3. Is that, are they doing, is there one for S and one for X, or are they both doing either vehicle? Uh, They both can do uh, each and also both together as as needed. So right now, uh, the Model S is still the majority of the production but by next quarter, uh, Q2 2016, uh, Model X 
uh, will be about 40% of their production. So very quickly, uh, Model X will be ramping up this this uh, quarter. And one of the things that I was looking at was there's already there's already been a bunch of discussion around Model X having issues. You know, there's always issues with new new cars coming off the line. I think Tesla. Uh, probably more than other car makers is willing to put those cars in the hands of uh, their customers. The Model X has already been stated by Elon Musk as one of the most complex vehicles ever uh, attempted to be produced. And so there have been some issues with the doors uh, and some of the locking mechanisms and a few other subsystems. Like the, the rear seats was, was a problem recently, wasn't it? Yeah, there's a recall on uh, 2700 or so. The Model X is um, one of the suppliers for the uh, uh latches for the third row seat um, was failing in the European testing. Uh, and so they voluntarily recalled them. And uh, so this is one of the reasons why uh, they they deliver to uh, West Coast customers first, so that if there is a problem with the vehicle, uh, you're actually very close to the factory. Well, soon they'll be able to just drive themselves back to the factory, right? Yeah, soon enough. You'll just wake up and the, it'll be in your garage all repaired in the morning. Yeah, uh, that will be that will be quite <laughs> nice, uh, unless the vehicle can't uh, move itself, which will be part of, That's the, true. Part yeah. of the problem. Uh, but <laughs> what's so, I think, mind-boggling and really hard to wrap your head around, especially for, um, for people who don't deal with production or anything with this level of complexity, is that the Model X has 8,000 unique parts. And so every single one of those parts has to be in the factory, up to spec, ready to go for every vehicle for it to actually leave the factory. And that sounds obvious, but <laughs> that means that if any one of their suppliers, and they have hundreds of them, is having a problem or having a shortage of their own, and they can't get that part, if one part for the Model X isn't ready, they can't ship a car. And so they have to coordinate all 8,000 pieces of that car and have thousands of them on hand ready to go and be able to assemble them and have their assembly process work and have all the kinks worked out for them to ship any one of the cars. And so what you see is this concept of a production ramp where you go from producing a handful of vehicles a week to 100 or 200. And now uh, they've exited the quarter um, just around 1,000 vehicles a week for the Model X. So uh, really fast, actually, um, ramp considering the amount of complexity. And so... Do we know how much is shared between the S and the X? So that's a funny part. And one of the main reasons that the Model X was so delayed was the original plan was that the Model X would be out uh, a year or year and a half after the Model S. So in 2013 or 2014. And uh, they thought that'd be possible because they expected so much more of the parts would be shared from the Model S that the X is actually running on the Model S platform. So the core chassis and the core design of the uh, X is shared with the Model S. Um, and this is a very common uh, pattern with car makers that many of the sedans uh, are the, the same base for their crossovers and for their small SUVs. The, the problem is that the X really uh, expanded its scope. Uh, the level of difficulty kept increasing as they kept adding more and more uh, niceties to it. And so the, both the schedule slipped and the number of unique parts for it that were not shared with the S kept increasing. And um, even as, uh, as recent as just a few weeks ago, uh, Tesla admitted that uh, the part of the reason that, that X has been so slow is that they're hubris in, uh, in trying <laughs> to produce the vehicle and how much they tackled. So it was sort of a humble brag. Um, <laughs> well, it is in Silicon Valley, so you're going to get scope creep as well. You're getting yeah. all the bad parts. Exactly. And I think that's one of the one of the challenges and one of the things that I think they will have learned and are going to correct for the Model 3, that they were developing the Model 3 in uh, con conjunction with the Model X. And they had planned to have the Model X out two years ago, and they had already started the Model 3 um, from the early plans that we can see from looking back at old um, quarterly updates that they had already been talking about this Gen 3 platform and starting some work on it. So it looks like the X continued to drag on as a project while the 3 was continued to be developed. And, and my hunch is that they uh, very clearly understand that the Model 3 is about mass production. It's about low cost and, uh, and making sure that they hit that deadline 
because any delay is going to have a massive, massive ripple effect that they won't be able to catch up as quickly and uh, they need to keep it simpler than the Model X. And so hopefully that's been a really strong reminder to them that uh, the X was um, uh, <laughs> a lot of lessons learned. Yeah, I, I think, I don't know, maybe we can do a future episode on this, but I, I, I'd like to talk about whether the Model X was a mistake or not. Like, is it is the benefit of the branding from like the advanced technology and the sexiness of the Falcon wing doors is, is all of that enough to way outweigh the well the problems that they're having and the and the enormous hurdles that it's causing so we could table that for later yeah i think just one quick thought there is that uh the margin and the profit that they get per vehicle uh the model x um will help contribute more cash to tesla that uh suvs and crossovers are half of the u.s market in terms of uh, passenger vehicles. And so it, it already is going to be about 40% of their capacity next quarter. So it, it will increase their production volume. And, uh, and so I think that it would have been better if it were simpler and, and, and released uh, a year earlier. But, uh, my short assessment is that it is the correct thing for them to do. I think they, the prototypes they showed for the Model 3 are uh, a year away from being able to be produced um, based on looking back at the Roadster and the Model S at the type of vehicle they showed and, and where that is in the development cycle. Um, those are production intent vehicles, which is you know sort of jargony speak, but that's the last step before the vehicle becomes uh, a production ready uh, vehicle. Um, so for Tesla, those cars they showed us were pretty far along. Um, obviously, they have some new stuff going on with the interiors, but um, <laughs> those were pretty far along considering their normal development cycle. So is, and when you start talking about like the numbers of vehicles that are being produced here, um, and you also mentioned the number of vehicles that other manufacturers are producing, and they're, they're in a similar ballpark of like three or 400,000 for a factory. Is there some sort of magic number there for when they're hitting the right margins for a given factory? That's one of the um, the big misconceptions about Tesla is that they are not profitable, which is true. Um, they are not profitable on a net income basis, which uh, basically means when you take all of their expenses and all their revenue together, they're losing money. Uh, but a different measure of profitability is looking at the cost of the particular vehicle and uh, the sale price of that said vehicle. So all the components that go into the vehicle. And in that measure, they're actually uh, best in breed, uh, second only to Porsche. So the gross margins on uh, the Tesla vehicles to date hover just around 20, 22%. The BMW, BMW across all their models is 20%. Audi is at 19%. Toyota is at 20%. Ford is at 16%. And GM is uh, the lowest in the, in the ranks at around 13%. What that tells you is that for every car that's actually running off the line, for that particular car, um, they have 20% margin. Um, so they're, they're making a bit of money on that. So for a $100,000 car, they're bringing in $20,000 in gross profit. Now, the reason they're not profitable is that they plow all that money back into capital expenditures, which is uh, building out the plant buying more of those massive stamping machines, building out a new paint, uh, paint area, uh, and building out the supercharger network, building out the store infrastructure. And so Tesla is spending at a very high percentage of the revenue relative to their competitors. And uh, also to your point, they don't produce enough vehicles to cover uh, all of those expenses um, with the margin on the vehicles. But when they get to the level of production of the Model 3 of 100 or 200 or 300,000 uh, a year, uh, they would actually be extremely profitable. And Elon Musk has already said that by 2020, they expect to be actually profitable and that by 2025, they plan to be selling a few million cars a year. And a few million cars a year is certainly very far off from Tesla as it is today, but that actually would be if they kept their growth rate uh, at what they've been doing uh, since 2012-ish, 2013-ish, um, they would get there quite easily. Um, and that's around 60% year-over-year uh, -year growth in uh, model production. So 
it looks feasible um, and uh, two or three million vehicles a year for context uh, Toyota does about 10 million a year um, GM does about 10 million a year um, 10, 10 million cars a year is sort of what uh, very large top manufacturers do. So two or three million would put them towards the bottom of manufacturers worldwide. So, so that's not even that huge of a, of a goal. But that would, that would require probably like four or five more factories, though. Uh, that, that would probably, that would probably do two or three more factories. Yeah. Um, and that would be something in, in Europe and probably something in Asia or another in, in the U S. Um, and the other, the other, um, level of difficulty add for Tesla is that they need battery packs and to produce half a million vehicles a year would require more batteries than existed in 2013 for everything. So every iPhone battery, every laptop battery, uh, that would eclipse that a number of batteries. And so that's why they've had to build the Gigafactory to make sure they have enough batteries to put in the cars because otherwise they wouldn't have enough cells to build the battery packs. And that would be a resource constraint for the vehicle. So not only do they have to increase production for just the actual car manufacturer themselves, but they need to build a factory to build batteries, which would be the equivalent of uh, you know, a car manufacturer needing to build their own engines, which many of them do. Or really, it would be the equivalent of having to like drill for their own oil. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Like, and actually, like making sure they have enough uh, raw material for that. It, I, and we should definitely drill in in a future episode about the uh, Gigafactory because it's interesting in its scale and in how, given the amount of like global battery production per year, like how much of that will be completely dedicated to Tesla and like how much of that is their defensible position. Yeah, I think that um, they will own those packs and they've said publicly that they would be willing to sell some of the extra capacity if they have any, uh, if it makes <laughs> sense. But they also have the power wall and the, um, uh, the stationary power for uh, battery packs for utilities. And those are already um, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue already pre-sold for those. So they seem like they'll be able to use those battery packs. And, you know, like we mentioned at the top of the show, uh, the number of reservations for the Model 3 already has been more than what they were expecting. So their aggressive plans that many analysts don't believe they'll be able to hit of half a million vehicles by 2020, uh, their own internal plans we're expecting fewer Model 3 reservations by now. So they have to adjust and accelerate their plans, which gives me even more confidence that they're going to be able to hit these targets, which may sound counterintuitive, but ultimately I think they really know what they need to do and they know there's demand and the people want the car they showed and they don't need to do any crazy tricks. They just need to deliver the vehicle. Yeah, the, kick, the Kickstarter is locked in. They just need to deliver the cars. Yeah. And, you know, luckily they've been producing at some volume, right? Like a, a few thousand vehicles uh, a week is, is definitely way more than they were doing a couple years ago. And so y- you got to think that they understand what the challenges are of producing these vehicles now. And one of the things that um, Elon Musk had said was that the, the Model S was built to prove that you could build a, an electric car from scratch and not retrofit a previous vehicle. And that was the intent, but it was never built to be uh, produced efficiently. The Model 3 was built with the intention to be produced at high volume and low cost. Just thinking about the actual mechanics of ensuring that the production engineering team and manufacturing team is more involved earlier on, you just have to imagine those people are in the room and that those are the people who are driving the schedule uh, much more than uh, Elon Musk and his fancies for the, the model X and, <laughs> um, and some of the sort of more intense features that we've heard have been, um, pet projects of his that I think if there's anything, uh, anything not ready now, it'll end up on the cutting room floor if they know what they're doing. And the biggest risk I think for the car is that too many things try and get added. Um, but if I was Elon Musk right now and I'm seeing that level of order, I don't want to be late a third time. Um, So you're saying because it's so popular, my my Model 3 is not going to be able to achieve sub-orbit and then land on a barge. Yeah, I don't think so. I think he's realized that that's just for his SpaceX company. That's so disappointing. It's unfortunate. (laughs) Such is life. Yeah. All right. um, 
Well, I think we, I think that's probably pretty good for this episode. I think we can, uh, we have a lot of things to drill on next time for the listeners. Talk to you later. See you next week.